Lincoln, we'll start with you. Has the ADF become too politically correct? Well, clearly it has. We've just seen and heard these dire circumstances that the ADF is in. Look, the ADF is an atypical workforce. Its primary overarching objective is to be able to deliver extreme violence to defend Australia, to defend our interests and to defend, quite frankly, our entire maritime approaches because we are a trading nation. Now, anything that undercuts that, and including the massive defence bureaucracy, anything that they're doing, anything that they're spending money on or policies that do not support that overarching um, objective is a waste of time. And now what we're seeing at the moment is that we're not choosing ADF members and personnel primarily on merit. We want the best, most capable candidates and we do not need the government and the department to be spending a lot of money on things like coming up and being a member of ACON. Now, ACON is the AIDS Council of New South Wales. It is now a national organisation primarily funded by government. But the Australian Department of Defence is a foundation member and a principal partner, and they have to undergo... We got this from the Freedom of Information, mm -hmm. the Australian Workplace Equality Index, which means they're changing dress codes, uh, IT systems and all of these things to fit in with this and I'll, I'll give this to the jury to have a look at later and that is not what the focus should be. Yeah, OK. Well, look, Neil, in your experience then, and as we said in the introduction and just alluding yeah, to what we've just heard from Lincoln, there's all these different changes to make it gender neutral, more politically correct. Is the ADF going woke? No. Why? Um, look, the problem is this is a cyclical problem and you can't look at recruitment without also looking at retention. They're two sides of the one coin. But the biggest problem we face essentially it comes down to two things. This country has chronically underinvested in defence both financially um, and, and culturally for many years under governments of both political persuasions and that's why we're in the pickle we're in. And the second thing is, is demographics is working against us. Um, the Australian Defence Force is the youngest industry in the country. Half the Defence Force... Um, is under 25 years of age. Two-thirds of the Defence Force roughly is under 35. Um, and they, as a percentage of the total Australian population, those age cohorts, particularly the, 20, the 17 to 25, is the lowest it's been since Federation. And so um, we're trying to recruit into a young in industry from a very small uh, part of the Australian population, and it is very, very hard. Now, it's made harder by many other things, um, but uh, many of them are cultural reasons. Some of them have to do with uh, uh, the ethnic breakup of the country now. Um, but being woke, um, or too woke, uh, would be a very minor part of it for the simple reason is, is that the defence force of any democracy has to be representative of the society it comes from. It's not a military caste. It's not a warrior elite. They are normal Australians who choose to help defend our country. Um, and that, that's the key part of the problem. Right, so uh, you're saying demographics. That's, that's the key issue here. Yeah. Tanika, look, I don't think um, the ethnic breakup of our nation has anything to do with it. Yes, it's not a warrior caste, but it is an atypical workforce. This is not the Department of Health. As, as I said, we in the ADF, our primary objective is to deliver lethal violence against other militaries because that's what they will do. They, they get the best that they can, they train them and they come to either um, take our interests or to coerce us, to surround us and that's what we have a military for and that's what we have an Australian Defence Force for and we need to have leadership from the top, from Prime Minister Albanese to the Defence Minister Richard Miles going to the Australian public and saying enter the Australian Defence Force because this is who we are, this is the values we represent and this is what you're going to do to serve your nation, duty, honour and those sorts of values that we pride ourselves on and have prided ourselves on for the last 200 years. Yeah, and I take your point, Neil, that the ADF has to represent the society that, it's, that it is representing. There has been a specific focus in particular on female and Torres Strait, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander recruits. Could one argue it doesn't matter what your background is, what gender you are, it's about recruiting the best people to protect Australia? Now look, absolutely. The job of the Defence Force is the management of applied violence. And you, you have to have people who are capable of doing that. But in the case of Indigenous Australians, for example, the Defence Force has a very proud record. Um, it produced the first Indigenous service officer 20 years before the first Australian civilian university graduate. 20 years! Um, in terms of, uh, of how other uh, Australians fit in um, to the Defence Force, we have 
a defence force that pretty much is a reasonably accurate cross-section of the country at large um, in terms of uh, uh, ethnicity. Um, it's not quite... Um, it has more country people and city people than the percentages of the country at large. Um, but in a democracy, you just don't go out and, and create a cast of people that you then segregate from the society. They actually belong to the society. They defend the society. They are the children of the society. They are the fathers and mothers of that society. Um, and that's your defence force. Mm. And we don't have conscription. Mm. Um, uh, we don't have uh, 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 an imminent threat of invasion tomorrow. The big problem is governments not spending enough money on defence right. and people in Australia thinking three generations after the Battle of Midway, it's always going to be like this, we don't have yeah. to worry. I want to go to the jury and just see how they're feeling about this. Mark, you spent nine years at, right. as an apprentice yes, in the ADF. Correct. What was your experience? Back then, the Army Apprentice School was mostly guys yeah. and it was all about a buddy-buddy system and you did not have the complexity that wokeism brings. Mm -hmm. It seems to infiltrate everything and we, we sit back and watch these industries fall apart because of that complexity. We just want to go and do a job. Like you said, we're there to do a job and we're there to serve Australia. Yeah. And we need to be clear in our direction. Absolutely. Bruce, you've got two sons who are soldiers. Former soldiers. Former yeah. soldiers. Yeah. What's been their experiences? Have they have they explained to you what they feel like the ADF? Yeah, or... based on that experience, I'm very proud that our serving men and women are the very best. Great. Um, but the profession of arms is a serious business. We're not going to defend the nation and defeat our enemies by worrying about their feelings or carpet bombing with personal pronouns. My feeling is that the fish is starting to rot from the head down. Uh, Lincoln, so, I guess I guess I just want to say, do you think that China is seriously looking at wokeism in their uh, their own army right now? No, so I don't think China is paying for gender reassignment surgeries, which the Australian Department of Defence is paying. Um, Medicare doesn't pay for gender reassignment surgeries. Now, this is um, the Department of Defence paying anywhere between twenty to forty thousand dollars for gender reassignment surgeries, uh, and that includes you know hormone treatments and all these sorts of things. Um, I'm just that's public taxpayer money, so why isn't Medicare covering that? But the Department of Defence does. I'm just not quite sure that really fits into the overarching objective of what a military should be, and I think that's causing harm to our military. I'm, not, I'm not sure that's correct. It um, is correct. It, it, I don't think it is. It's public. Well, it's public. I, I, I it's in the public it's domain, at all. But in, in the case of... In the ca oh, well, we, 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 we've we've led that. research in this for many years. Yeah. Um, gender reassignment surgery is a tiny number of people. Um, and most of the coverage you get in the Defence Force is coverage that people can get on Medicare. But anyone in the Defence Force isn't covered by Medicare. That's one of the points of the Defence Force. Medicare doesn't cover it, but the Australian Defence Health Service does. I don't believe that's correct. Well, well you're wrong. Well, I don't believe that's correct. You're and, wrong. And, well, unless it's changed recently, you are wrong. No. Um, the simple thing about this is that you need a Defence Force capable of killing the nation's enemies if needed. To do that... Um, you have to have certain psychological and health and other standards. Um, and the Defence Force does a pretty good job of managing this. Sure, there is interference from time to time by the extreme left and the extreme right on what you should think um, or what they think should happen. But simply, the, the biggest single cause of the Defence Force being underprepared is because governments of both political persuasions for generations have underinvested in defence because the Australian taxpayer has demanded that because they want the money spent on something else. So it's the Australian people who have been living in cloud cuckoo land for many years. Yeah. It's not our Defence Force. And we're now in the situation where we're chronically... The results of our chronic under uh, investment right. are coming home to roost and we probably won't have time to fix it before we might have right. to use the Defence well, Force in anger. 30 seconds mm. left. Lincoln, how much is, has investment played a role in this? Investment certainly said. plays a role in it, but, okay. we, but we've seen the Labor government chucking money at our soldiers and, look, I, who doesn't love that? But that is yeah. still not stemming the retention and recruitment problems. But so they're, it is they're not deeper chucking, they're than not just chucking money at throwing soldiers. money the at current the soldiers. Yes, they are, has cut, has to cut, keep them to sign up. The Army so budget it by comes from a billion dollars mindset over the and next we have 20 to years. Get on track again. All right. Well, look. Uh, look. This has been a big story this week in particular. Those recruitment levels are down, and no doubt there's something that needs to be done. But you've both had your say. It is now time to call on the jury. Jurors, you have 10 seconds to deliberate the following question: Is our defence force too woke to fight a war? <laughs> I'm going, yes. I'm going, yes. Time is up. What is the jury's verdict?
two no's and the rest of you. So 10 yeses and two no's. OK, Craig, why no? Look, they might be woke, but end of the day, uh, just means more casualties in war. Um, they're still going to go over and fight for us. I don't care if they're woke or whatnot. Yeah. Just get in and fight the wars when we need it. I fight the war. Michael, what do you think? Oh, I think absolutely it's too woke. I mean, I would think that something like national service where you can cherry pick the best people coming through like they do in other countries, like Israel, you know, from 18 to 20, yeah. and then see who fits the criteria of being a good soldier. So national service, you think, could be... <clears throat> Neil, do you think we'd ever see national service? Look, the problem with national service is purely and simply you have to decide whether it's universal, everyone does it, or selective, only some do it. Um, if it's selective, you then have the problem, how do you pick the people? Mm. Um, and that is in incredibly difficult, and mm. it's also very politically explosive. Um, the Defence Act provides for conscription in time of war or apprehended war. We may have to do it in well, the future, yeah. but we'll have to recruit, we'll have to conscript everyone, male and female, All right. not like in the 1960s. All right, well, look, Neil James, Lincoln Parker, it's a very important topic. Thank you so much for joining us for debate on the matter today. Thank you, Danica.